I'm Jonathan Citrin uh, with the Berkman Center and uh, the Law School and CS departments here. And <clears throat> I met Virginia when I was uh, a law student here. And I, I don't remember exactly how we got first introduced. I just oh. figured this all out and it, I'm going to save it. So if you can be able to, I'll t I think I know. Okay. Yes. <laughs> all will be revealed shortly. <laughs> and uh, Virginia was a grad student in comparative literature, is that English. right? English. English. Yep. <laughs> I don't know the difference between English and comparative <laughs> literature, because as far as I can tell in English, you also compare literature. But even then, despite my cluelessness in almost everything, especially English, um, Virginia was somebody who was tolerant, had this constant twinkle in her eye, was always finding the most interesting and playful nuggets within works that might be very old or very new. And so it seems so entirely fitting that she should end up as a uh, career journalist after doing the obligatory tour as a fact checker at the New Yorker. Um, she got to generate her own facts in the most postmodern of ways and uh, examines the um, ephemera and output of our popular culture. Uh, both through television and, of course, more recently, through the Internet. And some of the adventures which uh, Virginia may share that we've been on in excavating what's going on with the Internet and the culture built around it, uh, it's just hard to think of anybody better than Virginia at confronting it and confronting it in such a spirit of joy and twinkle and what there is to uh, discover. Never has somebody so smart been so unpretentious. Um, that sounded very pretentious, didn't it? So I certainly can't claim the title myself. I should instead just turn it over to Virginia Heffernan. Welcome. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so I, I, every time, as, a lot, as people who go to Harvard probably experience, and some of you who are here as students now may experience, when you, you think you've got it all together as long as you're outside of Cambridge, but the second I set foot um, back on the campus, I um, regress and can barely think that I, you know, uh, should have a place at this center table, much less this place with this microphone. Um, so I'm a little nervous, um, but um, I'm also reminded when I um, come back to Harvard that unlike in New York writing for the Times or Yahoo, where um, uh, it seems clear to me that the internet should be approached um, in a spirit of um, a kind of literary play, um, instantly at the law school, I, I start to think that I need um, more rational analysis, um, more reference to governance. Um, and, um, and it's hard to argue with anyone who says that um, what our, the digital revolution or, or, or digital culture needs is more rational analysis and rational governance. But it still seems plain that the internet is not a governable place not an analyzable place and not a rational place to me. Um, it's always been um, since uh, Jonathan and I first um, connected to the early days of the World Wide Web in the early 90s, a set of speakeasies and twisted clubs and back alleys and kind of Lower East Side tenements. Um, I think of the internet as a Jane Jacobs message board world and not a Robert Moses Facebook world, um, although that may be changing. Um, the um, spaces of the internet that first captivated me are illicit, they're polyglot, um, they're lo there's lots of masquerade there, there's a certain level of prowess required, um, and secrecy, um, because the straight offline world should probably not quite know how intense and hallucinatory and profoundly pleasurable um, this internet thing is. Um, some 15 years ago, the internet seemed so clearly a set of pleasure arcades and demimond cabarets that I was sure at the English department it would be seized by post-structuralist literary critics and anthropologists who would claim it for themselves, for ourselves. Um, now granted, it was the 1990s and deconstruction was smarting from the charge that it was relativist and amoral and French and creepy. Um, and uh, at the time, it, I, I, I agree that maybe physics or ethics or the law were rational and shouldn't be, should be exempt from deconstruction. But the shadowy, contradictory, densely metaphorical world of the internet, surely I thought that would fall to, to Derridians. And I considered myself an unreconstructed 
undeconstructed, <laughs> <and> aspiring <laughs> deconstructionist myself, so I wanted to be there for the spoils. Um, I didn't expect that Mark Zuckerberg would steamroll over those aboriginal villages and heterogeneous cultures um, and, uh, and produce his own kind of Stalingrad. Um, and uh, I didn't expect that Steve Jobs would um, attenuate the relationship between individuals and the open topsy-turvy web, creating what I think of as the web suburbs, better known as apps. Um, I didn't expect mechanisms of the market like um, Zuckerberg's and Jobs's and others to subdue or at least pave over the kind of Dionysian chaos that to me defined the web. Um, but let me back up a little bit. By the internet, by that phrase, right this very second on March 27th, um, I mean to designate um, very arbitrarily Spotify and Pinterest. Um, I think of, uh, when I'm trying to decide what to hold in my head as the image of the internet for a, a given hour, an hour at a time, um, I think of a review Anthony Lane wrote of um, one of the, I think it was like one of the end of the world movies, maybe Independence Day, um, where he said um, that in an inspired piece of casting, the whole wide world was played by the United States of America. Um, sometimes I think when we talk about the internet, the whole wide world, the whole wide internet is played by social networking. Um, when uh, it's sort of common conversation about what's going on in the web, um, the, top, the, the subject falls to, pin, to uh, Facebook and Twitter. It doesn't fall to ways the GPS technology plays out in mobile or um, the intricacies of search. Um, so at any given time, I know I mean something different, and you all maybe mean something different when we um, refer to the internet or, or digital culture. Um, but right now, just because I've been playing around with them so much, um, Spotify and Pinterest are what I'm thinking about when I refer to the internet. And I, so let's take a look at those two then. Um, when I look at them, I see how much, I see the same things I saw um, when I first signed on with my CompuServe account um, to, as a portal to the web. How much poetry there is on the web, how much uh, longing these services kindle in users, how many odd people you encounter, and how many strange ideas you're allowed to entertain um, on those, with those services. So 18 years ago when I met uh, Jonathan, I was a third year graduate student um, at this university in another yellow, haunted yellow Cambridge house, um, Warren House, that used to house the English department. Um, I was a TA in a class on Thomas Hardy and another one on Henry James. Um, I was 24 and I was settling in to become a G19, so uh, uh, with spooky eyes and a perpetually undone dissertation. That was like my local heroes. Um, and um, I thought I'd just walk around here w without writing a dissertation but talking about it um, for as long as they'd let me. Um, a friend of mine in New York thought I should meet her friend, um, a 3L named Jonathan Zittrain, because the whole thing, reason she thought we should meet, we had a common love of computers. <laughs> um, she knew that I was 737731413 at CompuServe.com. Um, and she knew that Jonathan was, okay, I don't remember. 76703,3022. That's right, the number is Oxel. <laughs> with a comp, wow. And it's weird that I don't remember because they're so memorable. I mean, they're like just little perfect gems of catchiness. Um, so when I met, exactly, when I met Jay-Z in 1995, he was, I think, or 1994 maybe, he was um, literally short-selling AOL. He'd gone to short-sell AOL because CompuServe was so ascendant, and he was also a sysop at CompuServe. I was studying Thomas Hardy and also committed to CompuServe. So we were both solidly on the right side of history. That's something we had in common. We had bet against AOL. We were ready to go with CompuServe. Let me make clear, though, I lost a bunch of money shorting LOL because I was right too far ahead of time. Oh, right. <laughs> Always a danger. All right, Jonathan invited me to audit a seminar he called the Cyber Law Seminar right here at the law school and superintended by one Charlie Nesson. Um, looking back, I realized, I, I, I just realized, I don't know how that introducing friend knew I loved computers. Um, I had taken great, great pains to keep that a secret, um, and um, I don't know how she found out. Why secret? Because the truth is, like Othello with Desdemona, I did love computers, not wisely, but too well. Computer addiction almost laid me to waste at a tender age. Um, I had fallen for network computing in the 1970s, um, 
Dartmouth, the college of my hometown, had set up a mainframe computer and given townies like me who were in grade school the chance to learn Dartmouth Basic, one of the first interactive computer languages. Basic was developed by the then president of Dartmouth, the great John Kemeny, um, and Thomas Kurtz. All I knew when the college hosted this demo of Basic for grade school students was that those of us eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, ten-year-olds who sat for the lecture had a chance of fulfilling that highest calling of all school children who, like me, were born around the year of the moon landing. We might one day work at NASA. Girls could do anything. Uppity astronaut girls unite. Off I went. Um, like most lectures, this one didn't captivate everyone, but a small group of kids were hooked. We had learned that you could make a program that would say, like, you're stupid at the end. And um, I was one of those kids. I just wanted more of it. So I asked my dad for a Zenith Z19 dumb terminal so I could uh, practice basic, and a rubbery coupler so I could dial in to the mainframe computer on our sole family line. Um, it, uh, tying up the phone for hours, and sometimes it seemed days at a time. And from there, I heard the first squeal and crash of information transmission, that mysterious complex sound that quickly became Pavlovian to me. When it hit, it meant I was in. In where? Well, into the internet. It was 1979, after all. Sysprogs, who oversaw Dartmouth's heaving rhino of a mainframe, already had network computing underway. They'd established something called Conference XYZ, something between an adventure game and a chat room. I gave up learning basic. I signed on as Athena, because when you're 10 and you get to choose your own name, you're a Greek goddess. Um, and actually, when you're older too, it seemed like other users, Dartmouth students and others, went by names like Apollo and Zeus and liberally referred to damsels and steeds and Stonehenge. I don't know why it had all this adventure game ambiance. Um, I'm going into all this not just for the pleasure of reminiscence, but because 1979 and 1980 were a time when the culture that most excited me and the people around me in my college town, which were books till then, books like Tolkien's novels, uh, television like The Love Boat, electronic games like Merlin, slipped and to me became digital. The world I entered there with Stonehenge and Damsels and Steeds and Athena was never a rational one. It was about magic and runes, and it was hard for me to see the internet. It's always been hard for me to see the internet as anything else. Um, very quickly into uh, the use of kids in, at, at Dartmouth, and also Dartmouth students who were using the computer, they almost always described themselves as playing the computer. Um, so my, when my mother wanted me to get off the computer and stop tying up the phone line, she'd be, say, like, you've been playing the computer for hours. Um, I wasn't using it, I wasn't working on it like we pretend we're all doing now. Um, I wasn't uh, uh, reading it, um, I was playing it. And somehow the idea that this is a game really got in my head. Um, something about the creation of, and also close to the adventure games like Dungeons and Dragons that it had drawn all this um, energy from and vocabulary from. Um, Conference XYZ had masters and slaves and it had, there was references to chain mail and um, that got a little bit lost in the chat. But somehow I still believed, and it still seems um, roughly true, that if you look at face, Facebook as a massive multiplayer, you know, online fantasy adventure game, you do all right. Um, y you know, <coughs> if you think of it as other things, you start to go wrong, I think. Um, but if you imagine that you're in a fantasy game with um, avatar creation and curation and that you're interacting with other players in persona the way that you'd play an adventure game or even the way you might play soccer, um, you, uh, um, you start to imagine what the rules could look like um, a little better. Um, it's also not a bad parenting rule of thumb for parents who are anxious about social networking. So like many of us over the past few decades, right then I began to attach my emotional life and fantasy life, the life that I might have entrusted to music or novels, or um, I, I, I attach those to this new symbolic order defined by fast distribution um, and display by collectivization, by atomization and loneliness, by an oscillation between connection and isolation, frustration at computers that fail, and then frust new frustrations with humanness, which fell so far short of the virtues of accuracy and velocity that were suddenly possible online. 
Um, there was something else online too, an almost deranged sense of longing and superstition um, that only the deep and weir weird populist black of cyberspace can conjure. I sometimes wonder if those of us who started computing before these ba beautiful backlit screens and before mobile, um, who remember when you were like looking into deep space in your, with the, you know, like the green letters, um, if it's only us who think of cyberspace as like fundamentally dark, um, because um, maybe you all see like beautiful, or those younger people who started later see like beautiful apps all lined up and don't think of it as like kind of haunted, but um, maybe someone can tell me afterward. Um, I, uh, I also, um, it, it seems to me like a religious space. So I know this is, um, we're in like kind of freaky territory here, but it's my experience that um, people who uh, talk about science are kind of drawn to, I uh, seem to me to be drawn to atheism, where people drawn to technology are um, more likely drawn to um, romance and superstition and sci-fi. Um, so um, every time I risk talking about religion and cyberspace or religion and the internet, um, I'm uh, uh, pleasantly surprised that it's not at least completely pushed away the way it might be um, when you're in a room of scientists. Um, it's been sort of part of my, um, part of the project of this book, Magic and Loss, to claim the internet for, for people in the humanities, for literary critics, um, and sort of um, rest it away or, or shake it off as a subject just for science and business writers. Um, it seems almost amazing to me sometimes that science and technology share space in newspapers. Um, technology, uh, every year I become more convinced that technology is actually the masculine form of the word culture. Um, that if you want to talk to men about culture, you tell them you're talking about technology and they're suddenly calm. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Um, so, and then as time, as time wore on on the internet, I, 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 re, I had to, to realize that the internet was not just a twinkly magic place of happy elves and people with chainmail armor, but also was defined by this persistent aura of grief. I should say that, that I've had real periods in my um, writing life where I felt like a Bolshevik or like a, in 1917, or like a, um, um, wild proponent of rock and roll or like John Perry Barlow or something where I, I thought like that resistance to digitization was, um, it was just this like passing thing that would have to be like, we'd have to like push through everyone's um, leftover, like small minded sense of grief about what they were losing. Um, and I used to hate more than anything when uh, someone would put the brakes on a conversation about digitization to rhapsodize about like the smell of books at Widener Library or how sad they were to that we didn't write longhand letters anymore. I was just like, oh, you got to be kidding. And like the Bolsheviks, maybe like listening to people talk about Baroque music. Or, you know, I was just like, come on, this is the this is progress. But that talk never really stopped. Um, and I think I've had to realize that that sense, that persistent sense of grief and loss is kind of intrinsic um, to the way the internet functions. And, and in a way, part of, the, part of the beauty and part of the problem of the internet. And it also has now had a profound influence on culture, um, uh, especially anti-digital culture, undigitizable culture that, you, that we see around us a lot right now in the form of the comeback of live music, um, the amazing, to me, fact that year, day after day, year after year, all people seem to want to do in this world is go to panel discussions and sit next to each other in small rooms like this. I mean, this is webcast. You guys could easily have stayed at your desk in you know, Missoula, Montana and seen this, but for some reason, we want to be in a room together. Um, and um, yeah, other kinds of analog technologies that have made comebacks, in, um, including like super traditional ways of uh, living that sh uh, show up in the steampunk culture and maker culture and uh, here and in San Francisco and Williamsburg. Um, I wouldn't. I don't think we would have predicted even five years ago that you know what, that the future would really have all this have all this rough edges to it and all this un uh, these undigitizable three D um, kind of 
fetishism, um, I uh, am reminded of something else from the period where I met Jonathan. I was um, a teaching assistant in a course taught by Philip Fisher on the 20th century novel, which is worth auditing by anyone who's, who's here. Um, and he was describing the influence of techno new technologies on prose style, like at the, ver at the level of how sentences are formed, what a new technology might do. And his, it, it, the example he gave was um, at the beginning of the movies, two important 20th century American writers, Faulkner and Fitzgerald, um, both were enthralled to the movies in different ways. Um, they both wanted to write for the movies because there was more money in it than novels. Um, but they also um, felt very threatened by it because storytelling in movies is different and very visual. And they had two really different reactions to it. Um, the Fitzgerald reaction, probably the one that I would have had, was more like um, was an effort to win Hollywood over, so to write really filmable sentences. So um, the, I, I think the description, I should find the passage he cited, but it was in um, Tender is the Night. And it's a description literally of a movie star. And you might as well be seeing like a curtain go up on her. There's a description of her emerald dress and her bright eyes. And you just like, it could be in Technicolor. He wouldn't have to do much to change it into stage directions for a screenplay. Um, Faulkner, um, while he also wanted to write for the movies, had a more like perverse, twisted side to him. And he, he wanted to write unfilmable sentences. Um, and so the sentences in late in August that Fisher cited were um, included one's really in the conditional or subjunctive. So like, if he had looked back, he might have been aware that she'd been thinking unfilmable sentences, um, sentences that can't be rendered in the movies. Um, and so I think, you know, not to um, spoil the surprise, but I think the, the part of the dialectic, um, you know, we're in right now, as analog culture was sort of superseded by digital culture, is, um, you know, some of us are kind of, um, courting, try, trying to create artifacts deliberately with an idea of them being digitized. And, and others of us, others of you, are trying to um, um, elude digital culture. So I, I don't think it's an accident that like foodieism is, um, is a reaction, I think, to digital culture. Um, you know, um, I always think like food is frustratingly can't be digitized. I'm a person that prefers astronaut food. I don't, can't tell the taste of one thing for the next. But I understand a lot of you think a lot about ingredients or whatever, and um, and um, and uh, and probably part of the pleasure in it is that it um, takes all that work and fire and things that don't exist on the internet. Um, so um, I I bring up why I came to the internet um, through this in the spirit of play and adventure game because I'm I, I do understand that people come to the internet for for. A, a, for different, you know, for other reasons than I did, not just for for social life or um, for you know experimentation. So, um, if you came to wage war or put men on Mars or communicate at Dupont or to promote your lighting installation company, I just sat next to someone on Amtrak who was working on his lighting installation company Twitter feed, um, or to exchange snapshots of crime scenes. You probably saw see technology differently than the girls like me who came onto it for social life at the dawn of the 1980s. Um, but I'm not sure that it's just the people that came onto it to um, uh, communicate at Dupont who should be responsible for kind of like for kind of theorizing it. Um, I because I because I, I I think increasingly there are people whose first encounter with digital technology is, is maybe closer to mine than it is to the um, architects of. ARPANET. Um, so to be candid, I should say that at this very moment, I can't believe I've even said the words Conference XYZ in public at the Berkman Center because I can still so clearly remember pre-Fight Club when the first rule of Fight Club, the first rule of Conference XYZ was there was no Conference XYZ. And it's an amazing fact that the world has changed enough that, uh, that, that I can bring up this thing that was like this kind of shameful strange place um, uh, you know, in the process of putting together, uh, like contributing a little bit to an official history of the internet. So Conference XYZ almost laid me to waste. Um, I met people who let me drone on about Reaganomics and Dartmouth football, and they never asked my age. Um, in turn, I got to hear their ideas about etymology and Aerosmith and nuclear winter, and no one told me to butt out. So it was paradise for a kid looking to grow up. I should also say that very recently I learned it was like a gay cruising scene. So I had no, 
but no one, there was no predator or anything. It was, I mean, it was mostly, I was, everyone was very polite, with mixed cases. It was a really very good scene. To my parents, though, it looked like addiction. And then at 14, um, my friends started calling me Desperado and singing Desperado when I came around because they believed I was into computer dating and it couldn't be cool in the real world. So at 14, I swore off my conference XYZ habit. I think there are a lot of us like this. And English literature seemed like the kind of thing a girl should study, not computers. So I went to college and I never visited the computer lab once. But the repressed returns. And in 1992 or three, when I first heard of email, I couldn't say no and I signed up like Jonathan did. And that's how I found myself working on an English PhD, enchanted with post-structuralism, um, which coincidentally offered a huge set of critical tools for understanding decentralized symbolic orders, um, and yet hoping that I could rejoin the march of digitization. To my delight, the internet was still new enough that everyone who talked about it, even Jonathan, brilliant Jonathan 3L, and Professor Nesson, and John Perry Barlow, who spoke during that first cyber law seminar, seemed to be bluffing. I am Athena. I am a 10-year-old pundit of Conference XYZ. So anywhere that bluffing is allowed, speculative and unfinished speech about speculative and unfinished civilizations like the internet, is that's where I want to be. I do think the internet may be the great masterpiece of human civilization. As an artifact, it puts to shame the pyramid, the aqueduct, the highway, the novel, the newspaper, the nation state, the Magna Carta, Easter Island, Stonehenge, Stonehenge even, the Chanel suit, the airplane, the pencil, the book, the printing press, the radio, the realist painting, the abstract painting, the birth control pill, the washing machine, the elevator, and cooked meat. As an idea, it rivals monotheism. Just as in Nietzsche's scheme, man created science, which in turn killed God, analog culture, books, clocks, film, industrial machines, the compasses and timers of scientific method, created digital culture, and now digital culture has superseded it. This is all extremely exciting. Of course, the digital world also brings dysphoria, this low-level but constant heartbreak that's one of its most controversial side effects. As I said, I used to uh, try to uh, ignore the blue mood that haunts most of the cultural writing about the web. Um, I, uh, I, I considered myself a sort of dialectical immaterialist. I hoped that we were moving away from stuff heaps of the past that I envisioned and sometimes still envision as those houses on hoarders that are just filled with three-dimensional things um, toward lives of near total abstraction. I really believed we'd be over our nostalgic fixation on analog culture and its totems very quickly. I thought even the manual typists and vinyl collectors would find the iPad soon or fantasy football and they'd be up and running. But it's still here, the persistent sense of loss. The magic of the internet is not working for everyone and in essence we're missing something very worthwhile and identity forming from our pre-digital lives. Is it a handwritten letter? Is it an analog phone call? A quality of celluloid film? A multi-volume encyclopedia? A leather-bound date book? Is it a way of thinking or being or falling in love? During the process, as some of you may know, of converting analog audio to digital, something is lost. Um, MP3 compression, in particular, squeezes out certain sounds believed to be superfluous to the ear. That transformation is known as lossy compression, in a beautiful phrase. Something we can't quite put our finger on is lost. Um, comparable lossiness informs digital film, digital images, and digital social life. Um, that profound, profound conviction that the web has taken something from us is an idea as old as the web itself. You can find plenty of this sentiment in alarmist bestsellers and articles and reports about attention spans as well as the superiority of vinyl to MP3s and paper books to e-books. Um, I, strong, having read the research now, uh, as I'm sure many of you have, about attention spans or brain damage caused by the internet, I feel very confident that this is a case, a, a, like a protracted case of a hysteria about a cultural object. It really sounds close to how people used to write about, uh, think, think about novels and um, how they morally corrupted us. Um, and it is pretty amazing that this is put in the um, vocabulary of cognitive science. Um, I, 
mark my words, cognitive science one day will be like bodily humors. It just, there's no, <laughs> it's impossible to get to the bottom of it and somehow people can learn it and do it without an undergraduate degree in it. There's no labs, there's no, no MRIs. Um, I, um, if I'm sounding defensive, it's partly because when I went to uh, sell this book, Magic and Loss, I wanted to um, refer a lot to culture and aesthetics. Um, and I was told that you could never, I could never use the word culture and certainly not aesthetics. Um, it, I mean, I, I thought if it was a not, if an academic book, it would be like Towards and Aesthetics of the Internet would be the title. Um, but uh, I really wanted the Towards also, but they talked me out of all of it. Um, and it really asked me, almost strong-armed me, is there any way you could say it's a cognitive science of the internet? I mean, I know nothing of cognitive science, and, um, and, and, and I've talked to other writers who've been asked to put cognitive or science in their titles. Um, it's just, it's, it, I don't know, it's just sort of a weird time. Um, many of, uh, many who, people who remember life before the web try to placate the more anxious among us by arguing that the internet is old hat a translation or a retread of other existing institutions and nothing more. Um, I thought the social network, the movie, did this um, by arguing that um, Facebook is just a blown up version of the social clubs at uh, Harvard. Um, eBay obviously has been you know, called a bigger, more eclectic Sotheby's. Amazon is a virtual Barnes and Noble. Craigslist is just like the classifieds in the Village Voice. Um, and lately, I, I think that that effort has even gone more strenuous and and there's more sophistry to show that the internet is just outside reworkings of old institutions. Um, I think that the internet and its artifacts are not just like their cultural precedents. Um, they're not even a rough translation or a strong misreading anymore of those precedents. Um, the internet na by now has a logic, a tempo, an idiom, a color scheme, a politics, and an emotional sensibility all its own. In my work as a columnist and, and in this book, I try to take um, individual artifacts and things like the um, hanging video of Saddam Hussein, the lonely girl videos that jo uh, Jonathan and I took some interest in years ago, um, various kind of hoaxes online, bits of um, music, MP3 music, um, and, um, and use uh, literary critical methodologies to try to understand those things. Um, Tentatively or avidly or kicking and screaming, nearly two billion of us have come to take up residence on the internet. And, and, and we've actually adjusted to its idiosyncratic ways much faster than, um, than sort of theory has kept up with us. Um, so this transformation of uh, everyday life um, in the central argument of the book is, includes moments of magic and an unavoidable experience of profound loss. I've come to recognize that as the central aesthetic dynamic of digital culture. Thank you. <laughs> Questions and how, does, how do you, Jonathan, you lead. <laughs> well, it's a kaleidoscopic journey, which is I, it's a wonder, it's just a great silence that just yeah, followed. Yeah. It was like a really thoughtful <laughs> silence. Um, and part of what I heard you asking for was, uh, it should be clear, by the way, Virginia has a new book coming out. I think I neglected that in the introduction. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Called Magic and Loss Towards a Cognitive Science. Oh, no. <laughs> By scientists who use a lot of scientific methods. Exactly. Um, it's called The Pleasures of the Internet. The Pleasures of the Internet. But I heard you, Virginia, inviting people to compare notes. I mean, a, a lot of what you had yeah. to say was very personal about how you came to it, and I couldn't even tell, too, the loss you were talking about was a loss of analog, and compared to the losses that was perceived when rock and roll came along and when the novel came along, but I also hear you talking about the loss of the early days of the environment, that that's actually what you miss, that that's what, um, in such strong terms, you describe <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg as setting fire to. That that's what you're losing. I, I love Facebook, and I'm and I actually ha I uh, no I don't feel I don't I don't really feel that way. I I I do feel that me no less than anyone else comes to the internet. Um, I try I keep also the internet keeps existing in different spaces for me. Like I think you say like the internet <laughs> like it's back there to you, <laughs> but um, anyway obviously right now it's at the screen for me. Um, I'm dogged by a persistent sense of loss, and sometimes I associate that with. Um, the change uh, 
especially the move to apps away from what I think of as the open commercial web. But, um, but I've been really happy. I use apps a lot, and I've been really happy with paywalls um, and, uh, and lightening the so advertising like burden. Winston Smith to me saying that like, you see you know, 2 plus 2 is 5. Right now, but you uh, don't really believe it. Really? Is that okay? Yeah. Well, maybe so. Maybe so, I, I, I'm always really interested in how people sort of came to their first encounter with the internet. So maybe, I, maybe you don't see it as play, or maybe you don't experience the lost part or the magic part. Um, and and maybe if I'm right, that has something to do with how you you first came to the internet. If it's if it was like an irritating thing that you you know had to move on to, or if you did sonar and radar during the war and were happy to see YouTube like some. <laughs> Um, like some uh, veterans have have said, um, I don't know. Maybe well, maybe someone can tell us about. Well, one other question on this okay, before yeah. we uh, open it up, which is, you talk about the experience that people get, kind of the first time they immerse in it. Now with its ubiquity, everybody's using it. On the other hand, there are still a lot of people using it for the first time. Kids are getting online. They're getting out of Club Penguin and coming into. Facebook or wherever they're going, and they have even more time on their hands than the rest of us goofing off at work. So in some sense, if the internet is the social networking space, yeah. one of the kind of moves you made, it is worth maybe dwelling on how much of that social space will indefinitely be defined by kids who are just starting to find their voice and be a little reckless and because 4chan, for example, seems to yeah. me both a place for kids and a place of great grief. <laughs> yeah. And but you, I think it's only possible to understand 4chan as a game, not as something real. Even though when they dox somebody, when they send out their armies forth, it's affecting real lives. And yeah, I I just had a um, my second actually run in with the formidable um, Paul Paulites, the Ron Paul supporters. Um, and um, I was trying to figure out because Rod Paul seems like the maybe the reigning president of the internet, and it, you know he's coming up on I think eight years, and there are no term limits, so <laughs> Ron Paul may really be the president of the internet mm -hmm. in perpetuity. Um, it is incredible the like silencing effect, real world silencing effect that his um, followers can have on actual journalists. Um, I, I, I you know tried to write a few critical things about him at the New York Times. We were so inundated with comments that a you know really um, sophisticated um, veteran editor, he didn't just publish a retraction or it blog style you know write a small correction. He tore it off the site and like buried. I mean, it's one of the few times it's like you can't find this thing anywhere except for like some screen grab by Paulites because that looked like a real show of force to him. And you know when and when Ron Paul didn't do well in that election and when he won't do well in this election, we still will think that there's something going on. So at, at some point I thought maybe the maybe real world, the real world that sees 4chan as very threatening, will start to see it as sound and fury that happens somewhere else. And the like the real world and the internet will just grow in these diverging lines. Yeah. It seems like you and I must really be in different parts of the internet because I could go for weeks without ever encountering anybody who who is who has any affiliation with Ron Paul whatsoever on the internet. Have you ever mentioned the, the words Ron and Paul in a blog entry or Twitter post? Oh, well, I might have mentioned a live journal here and there. I can't remember. Okay, but, yeah. You know, it's not it's not a subject of great interest in the places I hang out on the internet. Yeah. He is, you know, this fourth place candidate. And he's, you know. Yeah, well, I, I mean, um, you know, people have said before that part of the way we, y y you either feel maybe inundated with Ron Paul people, and that's a false impression, or you don't see them at all, and that you're also missing something because yeah. it is a, it's an, you know, it's an interesting libertarian crowd, and there's a reason that he dug in so deep on the internet. It's a, there, you know, it's a, he's got a natural following there. Um, anybody else want to tell like an originary story of when I first saw the internet? Um, so uh, it was high school. I, my brother was the sort of, you know, gateway drug. <laughs> um, well, and there was also like, so we used to like Fish, you know, that band that it was like shameful to like. But the rec music Fish online was like where you'd go to get the lore, like where is the good show, what were they playing? And so like, yeah, that's where we used to occupy the um, phone lines with, like cruising that area and right, just like 
spinning up such a big story out of so little information yeah. and so much fantasy yeah that you know it's like you know it's intoxicating right like the 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 te it was like teasers and uh yeah so it's right when it didn't give you everything you i filled it in personally with a lot of stuff that i wish it were doing did you contribute or did you like, <coughs> no i didn't right. contribute and i actually don't contribute much to the internet still oh yeah um but yeah uh, that's pretty cool um i'm not the, yeah the shame part is interesting i mean when we one of the johns in my first conversation at the cyber law seminar i think was about um which amendment might have bear some have some jurisdiction over some, whatever the internet was going to be and we were wondering if is this speech i remember what jonathan said at one point is this a weapon maybe this is a weapon um, and um, for the Ron Paul people out there, I just want to—I'm a big fan of the Second Amendment. Just yeah, yeah. right, exactly. Just Sorry. so that no one shuts us down. <laughs> um, but um, uh, so I, you know, when you when you when sort of people in law schools were wondering, is this a weapon? And you were at home thinking that this is a way to like tell a partial story of a shameful kind of fandom. Um, you know, we were having it was being read in, in very different ways. I think. Um, you know, there was a, uh, the, someone, Jamie Gorelick, who was she? I've, we've talked about this before. Jamie Gorelick was, uh, at the time, I think, just coming off of being Deputy Attorney General under Clinton, and we were arguing about encryption. Yes. And whether or not the ability to encrypt a message between two parties such that the government, even with a warrant, couldn't successfully intercept it. Um, the, the Clinton administration had been considering and had implemented export controls upon encryption as if it were a munition and that's the that's question that of came internet up. as a weapon right, yeah. Yeah, and she that. we went to, we went to dinner with her afterward and she was telling horrible stories of things that had happened in telephony and other communications technologies that had had insufficient government oversight and the one the main example she gave that was supposed to strike fear in all of us was that some pranksters had found a way to beat radio call-in contests by getting their phone to dial in over and over again mm -hmm. and like you know walk away with tickets to fish clearly not a state issue that's uh, a federal issue. Right. <laughs> exactly UN treaty perhaps but I mean the way she said this so somberly like what could the internet because we were trying to think of what horrible things the internet could be used for and finally to beat radio call-in shows I just thought like this is a lot of firepower I mean if there was Nesson and Arthur Miller and you and everyone was around the table and she was a government person and um, and we were all worrying a lot about the radio call and shows. But that, in some ways, when you think about what's changed since then, yeah. one answer is not much. There right. keep being new things that scare powers that be. Napster was a twinkle in the eye then, but yeah. came about and had the same pattern. Um, 3D printing is the next Napster. Yep. Yeah, we talk about a simultaneous trademark, copyright, patent infringement, all downloadable, mm -hmm. and then you print out a Nike swooshed mousetrap that um, uh, infringes everything at once and kills mice. Um, a weapon. A weapon, exactly. <laughs> well, it's true. You print out a gun, you print out the bullets, and away you go. It's That's going to be what Jamie Gorelick's worried about next. And maybe that's if maybe we're finally but, in some really dangerous territory. But I was thinking the thing that really maybe has crystallized just recently is it ties back to the magic part of it, too, which <clears throat> I hear in you the magic you discovered. And maybe it's just relating to me the magic I felt I discovered was there were people out there that I could connect with that weren't judging me or asking questions of me in areas that I didn't care to answer. And the first time you got the equivalent of, I didn't since I wasn't on AOL, you've got mail, and it's from a stranger, but it's something helpful or kindly. Like That is a real discovery. That's kind of a sense of magic, the fact that you can be interacting with strangers and yet they're not bad people. Yeah. That's really powerful. And when I think about what regulators might ultimately worry about getting away from the onesies and the twosies of encryption here and 3D printing there and Napster there. It's the power of the space to allow people who are strangers to connect with one another. But that is both a profound threat to many iterations of the state and it's also the profound magic that tells people they're not alone and there's stuff out there not mediated through the regular 
institutions. The the other I remember the other the other thing that uh, Jamie Garlick and others were worried about, and they st and still are worried about, um, was pornography and um, and there was a lot of talk about pornography that first year. And uh, you know when you talk about connecting with strangers that you haven't met yet, suddenly we're in this territory that construed a certain way could sound like pornography. The amazing thing about the internet to me is how the internet is not for porn. Um, uh, there Although it's an interesting that your chat room turned out to have an extra layer you had no appreciation of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably that's right. no coincidence. Um, yeah. Um, well, I, I, well I, I think the internet has become very good at doing something that borrows from the energy of pornography without actually being pornographic. So um, this happened kind of brilliantly at YouTube. Um, when YouTube first appeared and other video sites appeared, it was every it was just an article of faith that they were going to like kudzu. It was going to be like you'd call up YouTube and it would be overrun with the predator plant that is pornography. It would be all flesh colored. And it just wasn't. And what happened once that predator plant was cut back is all this other crazy diverse flora and fauna sort of bloomed on the site. And, you know, they, they did a nice job. And, and, and Jobs and Apple, uh, you know, does a, does a good job at like kind of keeping that at bay so that you know, hopefully other kind of things can develop, but it never loses that kind of illicit sense of like, I shouldn't quite be here. This thing is shot weirdly. I have like this particular visceral reaction to these images. A lot of early YouTube images were like, um, you know, showed accidents and danger and things that are meant to make you wince or laugh or have a physical reaction. So it's like kind of like pseudo porn um, so that, um, you know, parents feel uneasy about it even though it, there's nothing illegal about it. And that propels the sense of a pleasure. Which maybe is a quality of rock and roll at the time, too. Yeah, yeah, that you're like thing. almost right, almost crossing a line, but not quite crossing a line. And it's also so elusive from, um, you know, any kind of regulation. Well, but it uh, might teach Jonathan's lesson, which parents are scared of, talking to strangers might not turn out to be bad. Hmm. Yeah, right. And all kinds of like language mixing and talk about class lose mixing. lose. Talking about strangers could be bad, that's bad. Or it could be good, that's bad. Yeah. Either way, I don't want you talking, talking to, to strangers. strangers. And yeah. the internet is for nothing if not for talking to strangers. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I kind of have three things. I think the internet was sort of designed as a communication mechanism that was extensible. So it was designed so you could add lots of additional things to it without the designers of the internet really being able to envision or even trying to envision all the possibilities. Uh, you can look at it as a little bit like extensible computer languages or anything else that's extensible. It's opening up worlds without really uh, anticipating or, or even being able to anticipate the different directions. There are some, some other trends that I find interesting and maybe a little bit disturbing. Uh, one is the dichotomy between the Internet as a global village of nice people. The Internet was originally designed as a benign community of people you could, for a benign community of people you can trust, whereas when that didn't turn out to be true, it's also a trend to have being divided into lots of gated communities, virtual private networks, various censorship mechanisms that people are trying to superimpose on the Internet either to protect themselves or to protect other people with or without their permission. Yeah. And the, the third thing that people seem to um, not distinguish because there's so much virtual reality on the internet, it's easy for people, especially young people who are first being introduced to it, to sometimes have difficulty distinguishing between virtual reality and real reality. I was talking to some friends recently, and I'll relate this story since you like stories. There were uh, some small kids in Israel who had always been talking to their grandmother in England via Skype. And when she appeared in person for the first time in a while, they thought she had jumped out of the screen <laughs> and were next expecting the cookie monster to come out and join her. So uh, I, I think the way young people these days take the Internet and all of the things on top of it for granted is, is really becoming part of the underlying culture. And with the extensibility of things, it's leading in new directions, many of which we haven't anticipated, but with odd effects that... The, right before, um, that's, I'm glad you brought all that up. I, uh, right before I got on, or 
right before I dropped regular Dungeons and Dragons in favor of Conference XYZ, um, there were a bunch of books and stories about people who had um, started playing Dungeons and Dragons and then come to believe that they were clerics and had, were lost forever in this world. <laughs> um, I mean, that is a you know, all kinds of cultural artifacts are 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 uh, uh, you know, beginning with the novel. The one that you know, the thing that I, I maybe know best is. Um, you know, great terror that we're going to not be able to tell the difference between fantasy and reality. Um, and um, I think that, you know, 20 years of the web has sort of shown that it maybe doesn't matter that much that we don't know the difference. Um, in fact, or it's a losing battle to try to teach the difference. Now, I don't mean to go too um, science fiction on you, but I remember when they first introduced the concept of monocle for your mobile device, the idea being, which is I understand it, you can hold your device up and it's telling you something about the world literally in its position in front of you as you hold it as yeah. if you were wearing a monocle. Oh, yeah. So Yelp has a monocle mode where you can just see what restaurants Boca Grande swings around on your iPhone as you try to hone in like a tricorder. There's a wonderful um, Constellations app that you can hold it to the yeah, sky yeah, yeah, that's and it right. shows you the constellations. So we're really not, I think, that far from having that in your spectacles in your glasses at which point when you're plugged in and when you're not i mean we're already pretty close to it the number of people walking around head down through harvard yard about to hit somebody oh. but when it is in the glasses and i don't know how many of you now in a vaguely unfamiliar neighborhood before you dare to enter a restaurant want to know what yelp or <laughs> exactly so it, it starts to then be yeah i don't know the reality now is <laughs> more the, the stuff that's coming from online or as much as it is as what you see directly in front of you. I know that in uh, you know conversations about commerce and retail, it's always about hybridizing so you can both be on the J. Crew site and in the J. Crew store. Yeah. Um, and you know, online sites want to introduce stores like Amazon bricks and mortar and do as well as the Apple store has done. It's like an Amazon, but with bricks. It's, it's bri it's, right, kids, this is gonna be weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know how you log on, you enter a door and sort of yeah, yeah. Um, and um, and yeah, they, they a lot of talk about hi hybridization. Um, and you know, I just went to a recording studio um, um, with some friends who were making music, and they the place looks so different from an '80s studio with like a million, you know, all black and perfect and antiseptic. It's like all these weird old instruments and creakiness, and all they want are like. Um, tubes that you have to blow out because there's dust in them because you won't get good sound. And then there's all these Pro Tools, you know, at the same time around. So it's like, you know, the, like this Apple thing and like an old tuba all next to each other. And then like someone butchering their own meat in the background and everyone has an iPhone. It's like, great, you know, that's, I, I mean, I, I don't know if it's true that way in Boston, but that seems to be what digital mm. life looks mm. like um, right now in New York. Yeah. Mm. Well, I, I was going to say that just the, the augmented, the fact that reality is augmented digitally, I mean, it's it's augmented kind of in other ways, like street signs and, and store signs are a type of augmentation <laughs> where there's a symbolic layer on, on, on kind of the, the real world, except we just don't see those as augmentation anymore because they're transparent. And therefore, yeah. there's nothing new here. No, no, not that there's nothing new. I'm just saying there's, I, I agree here that there's nothing to worry about is that in, in initially, like the novel and... You know, in the 19th century, there was you know, kids were really into like recreating, uh, doing home theater type of type of things, and those practices were always seen as somehow escapist and threatening to kind of the uh, because they, they in a way they fall out of uh, uh, kind of regulation. Uh, or Would it matter to you if I mean it's really expensive to maintain? Think how old fashioned it is to like tack a sign every single corner in Cambridge. Somebody has to put a pole in with a sign labeling the streets because people didn't walk around with maps or anything. Like, clearly that's going to go the way of the dodo, at which point what you will see when you look out in a city is entirely unlabeled things, not augmented at all, because it anticipates that you'll have the device. Does that yeah, worry you at all? Clear, clear, clear things up. Hmm. Clear up some of the signs. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I think everybody's glasses will program what they want to see. You might even not see the buildings the way every you see. I mean, there's no reason we should see the buildings the same way. Uh -huh. I happen to like blue. You like green. Yes. <laughs> but I, I think we shouldn't um, underestimate the force of the Faulkners in the world who who 
want to the troublemakers who want to create like unassimilable gristly stuff i mean i really i don't know if anyone is as like impressed by this like like kind of back to the landism or whatever that's so alive um uh in new york there's so many kids in you know undergraduates who are really who love to talk about how they don't use the internet or they're off their phones all the time because they, you know, are too busy making their own clothes or, um, it's so, you know, I just think we couldn't have called you meet these people online or you, you encounter them? <laughs> undergrad, like, you know, undergraduates in colleges and, yeah. um, and, um, yeah, who are, you know, Etsy culture, you know, mm -hmm. which is very, well, yeah. that's what I'm wondering about when you describe this kind of thing is, you know, to what extent does the internet actually, you know, facilitate that type of activity rather than, rather than, you know, being some, something that the activity is re reacting against. I mean, I, there wouldn't be the 3D printing maker culture without, I don't think that would exist in the swarm, the current form without the internet uh, enabling a lot of it. I mean, there's some, maybe fish is a good example I, of this. I, I, think the knit, yeah. I think knitting culture has expanded. Because well, of the absolutely, the ravelry. Can't unite without a network. Yeah. yeah. Right, so. Um, they, uh, it occurred to me at some point a few years ago that one of the things, I'm, message boards I most like to go to were about this like incredibly sensory physical experience of perfume. So I loved reading perfume reviews, just like so far away from the thing, like some a perfume that I didn't have, talking to people I didn't know about a scent. You and, can't demonstrate online yeah. like you could demonstrate a painting. Scene. Right. And all I wanted was to like read a proliferation of language about scents that I didn't know, and then like imagine one day buying them. Um, and I don't know what that experience was about. I mean, fish is a really like you know, it was like really you think of it as like really earthy and human, and you all wanted to be together, but you also wanted to have this like symbolic experience of it too. Right, and you know, <coughs> you know, and people would talk about drug use and stuff, and like their drug experiences too. Yeah, like, right. It was like there was a whole bunch of different discussions that, um, and there's I feel like this the, the sort of this is, there's this whole thread running through what you're saying, which is exciting, which is sort of like. It's almost like this conversion experience story. Or it just seems like yeah. such a provocative question that you could just ask many, many people and they have a uniquely personal answer that's probably mostly just interesting to them, but they're impassioned to tell. Yeah, we, I spoke at a law firm a few years ago and I, the questions were, I thought the questions would be about, would be super rational about the internet. And um, this was, it's a, I won't name the firm because I don't want to get them in trouble. They were on their lunch break, sort of like this. And uh, it sort of turned into how people use the internet. And one of the partners said, um, I spend a lot of time going to the Wikipedia entry for my great, my ancestor, Calvin Coolidge, and just making small adjustments. Anyway, suddenly he was in this world of Wikipedia. No one, and then someone else had gotten interested in photo changing on Flickr at the time. Um, because first he'd been looking at crime scenes or something, weather patterns or something for us to think. And then he just started wanting to upload his own photos, as far as I know, billable hours. Um, but, um, but, you know, I, like people were not, the thing that, I don't know, the thing Jamie Gorlick or the thing that lawmakers believe we use the internet for does not seem to be what we're using the internet for. Um, and uh, you can't even get, you know, someone like the straightest looking person in the world to say that all he does is like, you know, formal email and checks like, you know, stock prices. Um, a huge chunk of time is like fantasy football or whatever. Yeah. So the story you tell of the lawyer is the story of a connoisseur going through the stages of connoisseurship, um, which as I understand it, you start with just an emotional reaction to a work, then you learn to taxonomize a little bit and you get categories. Then you eventually figure out how to relate the categories that you're creating to the emotions you first experienced. And then the final stage is you create your own work. And yes, I, yeah. so that was kind of this path you were talking about with him. Finally, he's uploading his own photos. And your path is one of connoisseurship. You are a connoisseur of this environment. Yeah. In a very wonderfully meta way. So I'm just curious, as far as the stage of creating your own work in it, yeah. Is it just the day-to-day -day of interaction that you experience, or as a writer, as a Faulkner, <laughs> how how do you see you your own contributing and building in this space, or is it again just kind of like breathing? It's a day-to-day -day thing. I I lurked for a long time, and then and now I just contribute to message boards under a code name that's not Athena. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> um, and um, and then yeah, and then sometimes you know. Sometimes, like an article I write, will show up on a message board, and then I just think there's another person with my name, 
who's also in the game somewhere, and that is not me. And do you comment on your own article? Mm-mm. Oh. I don't defend my like sock puppetry kind of thing. Uh, I don't defend. The Lee Siegel rage yeah. against the machine. Um, but um, but you know the, the prowess is important here. I mean, you you learn things like no, you know, no, you know, you don't troll and sock puppet. That's like kid stuff. Um, <laughs> But it takes a while to learn. I mean, I, I think it's worth like not contributing for a long time until you know the rules. I mean, the old message board thing of like, read the whole thread before you post about flashlights. We've already talked about that. Um, it, it seems valid. I want to tell one other thing about anti-digital culture that I just remember because it's a recent thing. Um, a fascinating example of a, a company um, kind of approach, uh, uh, embracing the, the Manufacture of undigitizable artifacts. Acuity, the insurance company, last year issued its, um, I don't know if I told you this, but issued its um, earnings report in a, the form of a pop up book. Um, pop up books are all made, including the mass produced ones like Path the Bunny, are all, it turns out, made in China in this only in one factory by hand. Um, you can't actually like press them through machine style. So they made this thing and it was like really beautiful. And it, incredible with like all these little, I mean, the greatest pop up book I've ever seen, and then made a limited edition of them. And it cannot be distributed online anywhere. It can't be reproduced. It can't. And so it, the first ever Acuity earnings report that was like a covetable object. And, um, and um, you know, really, I think, really smart. In a, I mean, really smart if you, you know, care about market capitalism. And along that spectrum, is your book going to have a life digitally online without? barriers or will it be somewhere in the middle where there's a Kindle edition or how? Um, I, I mean, as far as the, uh, it's funny because, you know, it's like thinking about the future of publishing, it's hard to find people who are willing to pay for 3D books now, except one kind of person that is really willing to pay for 3D books, authors. So the, the author of the book always wants a ton of 3D, of like real books. Um, but readers don't seem to want them. But it is amazing, the self-publishing, you know, the idea that you'd pay $40,000 to publish your own book, and that's not like a shameful vanity enterprise, but like the only way to really get it in print. Um, I don't, I really, I, if the publisher decided to skip the staff of the print thing, I think I'd be okay. But would you be okay with having it freely available online? People can email big chunks of it to one another or comment upon it, or is it just... Um, yeah, I yeah, I I um I don't I, I try to get people the same way I try to get people to explain why vinyl sounds better than MP3s. I try to get people to explain why they're like what's so bothersome about um, plagiarism or the demise of, of intellectual property laws and the way that book payments go. You don't expect to see that much on the back end anyway. So I'm, I wouldn't maybe if I were making a ton of money by mm. keeping the value close, I would um, worry about that. But um, but it's hard for me to feel emotionally attached to. It's just been, you know, we've all been writing online for so long. You're used to people cutting and pasting stuff. But yeah. um, that doesn't stop hearts from being broken. So. And you've been around it with the New York Times, paywall, no paywall, out there, in there, now a complicated system that appears yeah. to be working. But the... I, th I, don't, I, like, um, I like my in there part to be really um, unreproduced. I, I, you know, like um, actual barriers instead of legal barriers to reproducibility. So like, you know, I don't know. I just saw the eight hour um, gas performance of The Great Gatsby at the public. And, um, and it's, there's something wonderful about seeing something that can never be reproduced. Um, and, um, you know, talks like this one will never feel the electricity in this room ever again. Um, and, um, and, you know, then you don't have to have like an agent and a lawyer enforcing it for you. So you mentioned technology is uh, the male instantiation of culture. <laughs> Am I right in noting that all questions have come from technologists rather than culturalists <laughs> in this framework? Mm -hmm. Anything from the ladies? <laughs> That's another way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Does this, uh, this dive with your experience? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, this is, uh, I was just wondering if you've uh, read about the new Bjork album, which is being released on iPad um, and, so, and has like interactive capabilities and I, I'm sorry, could you speak better? I was wondering if she's heard about, uh, or if any of you have heard about the new Bjork album, which is being released as an interactive type of app rather than a uh, uh, CD or MP3 or even online uh, MP3. And um, just, I'm just interested in that in the future of the recording industry because that seems like something also that will be difficult to pirate and 
also uh, something that people will want to consume? Yeah, I mean, like all moves toward Apple, I mean, I, I, I definitely approve of it, but it's one of those things that looks progressive and advanced, and it's, in fact, like, incredibly conservative. I'm just like, what a great idea to freight it all down, probably charge nine ninety nine, and, you know, fill it with video and make it only playable, playable on iPads, and, you know, it's exactly the opposite of the kind of stuff that, you know, John Perry Barlow wanted to see in the music world when, he, you know, he spoke here 20 years ago. Um, it's... It, um, it's like a tricky testament to the way the culture evolves that um, you know you you can look really tech savvy and be at this at this stage especially I mean Apple's paved the way for this be sort of anti web anti glass nosed um, you know pro intellectual property law um, and yet look like you're doing the most advanced thing um, it's like a really it's a really conservative time but it's a really interesting time I mean I'm not I I like the suburbs as much as the next person I don't you know and the web sometimes looks really junky and dangerous to me I, I wouldn't if I were Bjork I wouldn't put my stuff on MySpace either you know she's she's um that's a savvy move um especially someone associated with that much um with I love how MySpace is like this total outlying jungle run by News Corp <laughs> yeah right <laughs> you know, exactly. that's really dicey well, she's sort of just abandoned like neighborhood creative project I don't think she I just I just noted that that would be interesting. It's yeah. interesting that it won't. It'll be difficult to pirate, and it might it yeah. might change the way people release their music. But I think she wants it to be like, or at least her record company wants people to think that it's this really interesting, creative way to interact. With it's music. and it seems perfect for her because it could have a lot of video and maybe even game stuff. And I mean, it sounds great. Yeah. I, I'll, Doesn't I'll that end up being just basically a challenge to people to to break it, and remix it, and produce something else from it? <laughs> So far, the Apple Store, the, the App Store, has done a nice job of making that impossible. But maybe uh, we'll see a bit towards full piratable. I don't know. Are iPad apps? Is any, does anyone rip them off? You know, yes. it's. I think really? the price point is set to make it so the only people who are going to do it are Mako. <laughs> so, because well, I, I he does it do for it. the joy of it. But okay. you would establish that you could, yes. but then you wouldn't because <laughs> you're better than me. Somebody wouldn't do that to save price. Somebody you wouldn't can do that. Do, you can do that? Oh, yeah. Make, you should, you should so make that code. So, <laughs> uh, so, so, I mean, so, the an, so the answer is yes. There, there, are, there are versions of, like, there are places where you can get all these apps which are stripped of DRM for the Apple Store and also for, for Android stuff. Wow. Um, uh, <laughs> but they are, it's like Chanel bags or something. Like it just, it's disreputable enough I mean, that it's. I don't like, know. So, so, I mean, it's all right. I don't have, I, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I don't have an iPhone. So, I mean, like, like to answer that particular, or an iPad. And, yeah. um, uh, uh, in part because I, I mean, primarily because I, I actually am, uh, I don't like the, the restrictions. Yeah. Um, um, on them. So that's, I'm like sort of, uh, but, but, um, my, my understanding is, is that there are sort of other places and you, it's a little more complicated. You have to have your iPhone uh, or iPad sort of like jail broken. Yeah. You need to sort of, I'm sure go into some particularly sketchy, even sketchier than my space. It is just uh, funny though. You don't want to jailbreak any phone right. that requires jailbreaking. That's right. Which means that the jail works. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. I mean, it is. I mean, there seem to be no shortage of other people who are uh, yes. uh, per perfectly interested in spending their time on that. I oh. mean, Apple is right there in whatever this next stage of the digital dialectic is because it looks like this, you know, super creative company. It's what creativity looks like now. Mm -hmm. And yet. Um, we all think different. We all think different. Exactly. <laughs> what a fascinating. Ooh, yeah, move. You know, I think a more exciting example here for me is, is somebody like Louis C.K. who released his uh, you know, stand up tour for five bucks to the community directly, just totally bypassing distribution channels, publishers, yeah. uh, and being kind of showing that this is a viable uh, model to just totally. And, and, and some say it is, and others say he rose to prominence and got people eager to pay the five bucks thanks to all the traditional ways of succeeding, having your Comedy Central show, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. true, but yeah. Fair point, fair point. Um, we need to stop. Um, Virginia, um, thank you for sharing your journey with us from <laughs> the you. days of glowing amber <laughs> to now. Keeping it um, personal. And uh, for recreating in our room the magic that, for those of you out on the webcast, thanks for listening in, but it's just not the same. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see you in cyberspace. And